1945, we had the end of World War II. In the 1950s, we had the Korean conflict. And in the 60s and 70s, we had the Vietnam War. When all of those wars and conflicts ended, the military men came back with martial arts. And there were pockets of martial arts in the Northeast, in the tri-state area, in California, in Detroit, and in Texas. And up until that time, it was adult men who were training, but something happened. In 1984, Columbia Pictures released The Karate Kid. <laughs> and just like that, martial arts changed forever. It went from being something for adult men to something for children. I wanted that. I saw The Karate Kid and I thought, I want a relationship like that with Mr. Miyagi. I want a mentor who's gonna teach me philosophy and, and hold me accountable and give me hard work. With the transition from these adult men to children, they had to figure out how to package martial arts for American parents. And with that, there's buzzwords like discipline and respect. And right behind them in all of our flyers, it's confidence and self-esteem. And it's true, we really do teach those things. I began training in martial arts in 1991. And in 2007, I opened up my own school. Well, it's been 15 years, and now a lot of my younger students have become young adults. Well, there's a problem. As my school's gotten older, some of my young adults are teaching, and they'll say to me, Sabanim, that's what they call me. They'll say, Sabanim, we're talking about belief. I don't know if I really believe in myself. That was really hard for me. I was like, how can we tell parents that we're gonna develop this in their children, and then when they get to these teen years, they don't really feel so good about themselves anymore. But it kind of tracks. For those of us who take ourselves seriously as martial arts instructors, we spend a lot of time studying childhood development. And if you think about it, when you're a little kid, it's really all about how you see yourself. You know how like a little kid will turn on the light switch, and they're like, I did it! They did not need you to be proud of them, but they will ask you to watch it over and over. <laughs> when they get a little bit older, it's not about how they see themselves. They want mom and dad to be proud of them. They'll say, mom, look, I got an A on my paper, and you need to make a big deal of it because that's how they feel good about themselves. But when you get older, it's really not about what you think about yourself or what mom and dad think. There's a transition. When they get to adolescence, it's all about what their friends think. And when I was a kid, I remember that. Like, I remember being in high school and going, oh, that girl's so pretty, or that athlete's so good, or they have a great car, and I admired other people. It definitely does affect your self-esteem. So it all tracks, it all makes sense. It is a little different today. I think that when I was a kid, I just observed, you know, everything that somebody does. But today, people just give you the best version of themselves. With Facebook and Snapchat and Instagram, you're not just seeing like their whole life, it's like their best possible life with a filter and they only share what they want you to see. So I think it's probably harder today to be a teenager than when I was a kid. I don't think it's just about how people look. Palo Alto in California is like a mecca for innovation and technology. And Palo Alto High School, where all of those people's children go, their suicide rate is five times higher than the national average. This is a real challenge. You know, sometimes on Facebook, I see this post, and I bet you all have seen this too. It's, it's like a copy and paste thing, but it's like, you know, share this post to let someone know you love them for suicide prevention. But I don't really think that it works like that because how you feel about yourself, that comes from the inside. It's a little bit like if you had a flood in your house, like if the toilet is flooding and then someone tries to patch up the roof, it, it's not gonna fix the problem. So how do you get someone to like themselves from the inside out? Well, I shared with you that it was, the, it was similar for me as a teenager, the comparisons, but different because of social media. Well, what's the same today 
for teenagers as it was for me and my parents before them and their parents before them is that you cannot tell a teenager anything. Am I right? <laughs> you can't. You have to inspire it from the inside out. So I want to share with you the four steps that I really, I used it with, for myself. I went through a divorce and these were things I did to help myself feel better and change how I think and I've shared it with some of the young adults in my life and it's working great and I want to share it with you. So the first step is to create an epiphany, that aha moment. For me, that happened when I read the book Untethered Soul. In the book, there is a part where he's talking about all the thoughts that we have in a day, you know, those thousands of rambling things. You know, sometimes that voice that's so hard on us that, you know, we are not even being our own friend. That voice, the things that we sometimes say, we would never even say to another person. Well, in the book, he talks about how the voice is not us, we're the listener. And I was like, what? I'm not that rambling voice. Now, I do understand that the voice in my head is me. I'm not crazy. But <laughs> I think the message is that the voice in your head is like the lower level self. It's the reptilian brain, the reactive part of us that's there to keep us safe. But the higher level self is the listener, the conscious part of us that uses reason and logic. And just that alone helped me start to make a separation between all the things I think and all the things I feel. So the first step to helping someone feel better is to try to create an epiphany. So how do you create an epiphany? <laughs> the second step is through questioning. I really like Byron Katie's book about four questions that we can use to peel apart the things that we think. I really focus on the first two. And they are, is this true? And how do I know or can I be absolutely sure this is true? I'll give you an example. If I have a young lady come to me and she's like, <laughs> my boyfriend said he hates me, and she's very upset by this, I, I'll ask her, like, is it true that he hates you? He said he hates me. Well, does he really hate you? Well, he was really bad at me and he said it. Is it absolutely true? No, I don't think he hates me, but he's really bad. Okay, so was maybe he just trying to hurt your feelings because he was hurt? Yes. What's important is to learn the questioning so that you can use it in other areas down the road so you can peel apart some of those ideas. The third step is helping someone identify the gap and the gain. That idea came to me um, through a book by Dan Sullivan. And what it's really about is not measuring ourselves against the person that we want to be or the person that we think we're supposed to be or the people that are around us. I'll give you an example. If my friend in high school shoots basketball and they do 50 uh, slam dunks in a season, and I'm a baseball player, and I hit 35 home runs, and I don't feel good enough because I only hit 35 home runs, and they had 50 slam dunks. It's apples and oranges, and it's never going to be enough for me. But if I think back to maybe last season where I only had 30 home runs, I can go, wow, I did five more this year. That feels pretty good. When we measure backwards, we can feel pretty good about who we are because we're always making progress. And teaching someone not to compare themselves to other people, but only to themselves is a win-win. The last step is definitely the hardest one. And that is encouraging someone to read books, listen to podcasts, download Audible, and take in new information. The goal is to shift perspective. We have so many thoughts. In order to change some of the patterns, we have to have some new information. I do think teenagers are inundated with homework and assignments and sometimes excessively. So asking them to pick up a book can be really challenging. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. What I found is that when they're really having a tough time and the pain is enough, they'll pick up the book they'll download the book, they'll listen to a podcast, and they'll feel better. And not only do they feel better, they're so excited that they just want to share it with everybody. They'll tell me how they gave it to all their friends, they start book clubs. I'm not kidding. They're very happy to share it because it made them feel better. When you're able to teach the four steps, 
then they're able to pick themselves up when they're not feeling so great. I told you that I did a lot of this work when I got divorced. And something else I did when I got divorced is I used to go on YouTube all the time to figure out how to fix little things. And I, <laughs> to this day, I will not use a manual if I have to assemble furniture. I'm like, no, I'm just going to go watch the video. They're going to show me how to do it. It's foolproof. Because when I try to find the manuals, it never works out for me. So I wanted to share these four steps with you today so that you can pass it on to someone else and they can learn how to fix their own plumbing. Thank you.